and I'm from Delhi. Uh, I've been programming in Erlang and Elixir for one year, like for some month, and like not straight, like, but more for like uh, uh, learning rather than actual work. So this presentation mostly inspired by my uh, journey, mostly because I, uh, I wanted to participate in this pro uh, project by Google Summer of Code, where I had to write a database driver. Although I wrote the proposal, did not get it through, but along the way, I learned a couple of things. And I'm here to share with you guys. And the first foremost, it's really honor for me to have a person who inspired Elixir community, Bruce, uh, uh, attending my talk. <laughs> so this is really a proud moment for me, like right up there. Uh, uh, maybe right above the, the talk I gave at ElixirConf by Google Hangout. So this will be the second one, like on the top. OK, so I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, once I get in the zone, everything will be work fine. So how many people know uh, database drivers like in detail? Like uh, how many know what a hand check packet is? Anyone know any, anything about drivers? So because I was worried like most people will know about this thing and then talk will go through. So I will try to build intuitions and then we look at my prototype and then we look at actual uh, production ID the, written by Wostack. Uh, he's a uh, core member of Elixir core team and, and he's maintaining this uh, driver. So yeah, so my blog and my community at Delhi, we are a small community, we're trying to learn and grow. So before my talk, I want to thank Erlang Ecosystem Foundation for sponsoring my talk. They have uh, provided me sponsorship for my travel and, and all. So really thankful for this community. It's a new community. And because of that, it's possible for me to be over here and give this talk. So thank you, Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. Do check out uh, if you want to build a community and you need funds and resources or people just to uh, for a workshop, or, and they can give you guidance. So it's uh, so yeah. So what's my goal is one of the most powerful and one of the most beautiful thing which I like about uh, Erlang or Elixir is this pattern matching. It it's everywhere, either in function, you pattern match and stuff. It just it idiomatic to do this way. It's it's encouraged and it makes super convenient to build parsers and and all, and as well as we see how it is makes more convenient to build uh, database drivers, which is quite complicated in object oriented language. I look at the source code of a couple of drivers written in JavaScript and and no uh, slash node or some other languages. It's way complicated because to do those parsing or binding data, it takes a really good amount of efforts and enge engineering to accomplish that. But in Erlang, from this talk, I'm 100% sure you can go home and can write a pretty decent prototype of your own driver for any database driver. If you know the protocol well enough, you can prototype really quickly. So how many know like what is the ELF binaries and all? Everyone know what's a executable file format for that. So I'll explain it, that one. And we build a very minor parser for that. We'll parse those, and I'll show you a command which already exists on most of the Linux platforms. So you can use that to like inspect what is my executable, uh, has the information in system, v 64 bit and all. So you can get that information right using this pattern matching concept. And for this, I want to thank Wostek again because he so given me this idea, this is possibility, and and all the tips he has given. Thank you. And then we will learn about Gen TCP APIs because we are talking to a some sort of server. So you need those communication over the wire. We need this. It's right over the BSD sockets. So it's just an API in Erlang to do that. And then we understand a bit about protocol and we try to convert those 
Erlang, uh, uh, the clients of a protocol packets, like handshake packets, OK packet, and all, to Elixir native types. So binding pattern matching, as I say, is a very powerful feature of extracting bits and pieces of any big, large binary blobs. It makes it super convenient. So for example, this is a very simple example. Let's say we have a string, which is itself in Elixir is a binary data. And we want to extract maybe the functional part out of it. So you can describe literally, this is the intuitive part. Uh, this is the basic fundamental idea about building parser. You describe your data that this will is a binary. It has a certain this size. And I want, I'm looking for this. And voila, it's right out there. You you are able to extract that out of it. So the first able to bind to that uh, string. So we have a different types and to if you want to describe your the binary data, it could be an integer or, or it could be a floating point number or a binary stuff. So it has all certain size. So you need to know the units so that you can figure out how long that integer is or how long that uh, string is or how, how long that float is. So you need to know this thing, although uh, it becomes really uh, intuitive. And we come later to this formula. And also you can, you want to be very specific. You want to do a specif uh, very specific, so you can have on those integer data or floating or strings, you can further drill down to fundal, fundamental building blocks. Like it's, uh, it's assigned or unsigned, or it's, what is the, uh, the machines, uh, it's an Indian ins or little or big, and, and so on. So you can have these modifiers to further drill down to when you're doing your pattern matching. So the first example we're going to look uh, is a PNG file. It's a binary image. Uh, bi it's a binary object, right? Uh, it's an it's a, uh, image. So if you look, uh, I try to read the image. And this is the binary description of that uh, PNG file. So if you look here, it, this is 137. It's this number describes that in each PNG file, there is this number will be keep reoccurring, which signifies that this is a, a, a type of a PNG file. Similarly, for a JPEG image, the first will be 255. So now we look how easy it is to write a parser for that. It's right out, uh, out from the Elixir docs. So So for the PNG signature, you describe, OK, the PNG files has this description of binary data. If the binary data correspond to this particular uh, string st structure, it's going to uh, be, this is a module attribute. So it's like a constant in Elixir. So the, here we are taking advantage of, again, the in function definition itself, the pattern matching. So when when you have when you try to read a file, for example, you can have like image typer uh, dot type, and you can pass in, for example, a binary image of a JPEG. So it will uh, pattern match the first first uh, binary uh, the binary strings, and then it's able to uh, pick it up that it's a part of a, it's a PNG or a JPEG image, or otherwise, so on. So this is what I was talking about. Uh, each executable files uh, in, in Linux operating system or in Mac, even in cases of Windows, we have like, the, in Windows, I think it's a PXE or PEX something, which is a some sort of a cover to have your binary, your, your executable right into it. So, so for example, here, 
uh, there is a built-in command in Linux operating system called read elf, and I'm passing this flag dash h. I just want to know the header information of this executable. So these are the header information. For example, this uh, the magic is is just what it is. It's just a magic number. Uh, there's not, no meaning to it, but it just exists. Uh, even if you look, just a minute. Just l take a look into, in more detail, the how ELF files are. This is from the Wikipedia. So it's a uh, any Linux executable or any executable, but if we are talking about Linux executable, these uh, ob uh, these executable files has certain sections. The first one, the header, the header which is only this elf header part we are talking about, uh, and then we have sections and all. So this describe what's an actual native bind native executables looks like. And so, which composed of header? The header is parsed. The program header is parsed. And so, so what's a elf is is clear. It's everybody, right? So we can have information such as this application binary. What is version is? So for this case is zero. There are a bunch of more for different operating systems. Of Maybe you can look. So this is the magic number we uh, we saw in the previous slides, right? Zero X seven F ELF trans this is the ASCII sense. So what was the ABI version? Hmm. Over here. For this is zero. It is often set to zero. Uh, regardless of the to because most it's even over here it says it says system v type executable right it's a unix not a linux i don't know why it doesn't show the for the linux but it's often just what this is this is it. for different operating system for example for the hard kernel it's 0x04 to describe its api So I try to uh, convert that executable right into a, a, a base 16 a, or a hexadecimal uh, so that we can look directly into it. So we can see from here what this, these uh, information were, is right present into this particular binary string. Even when we can't even in, look into it, but this is more clear because all of these information right built into executable. These are information is required by the loaders and all those programs which actually load those executables and execute that program. So these are the things already exist in this binary. But if I tell you to write a some sort of a parser in C or Python, it will be really hard to parse this thing. It will take a lot of effort. But in Elixir, you can do it in like in an hour, maybe. So I'm creating a module called read elf, just to read up just a, a basic Elixir version of this program. And I'm defining a struct, all the things I want from this executable. I didn't try to go all of those, because uh, figuring out all those, how big sizes of those strings are, is really difficult. But once you figure it out, you can do it in very succinctly or easily. But you have to figure out this is the size, this is. So it's very tedious, but very intuitive to write it. So 
I describe, for example, uh, a magic number. I already know it's a binary and had this particular size. So it's going to pattern match and do that executable. And I just took out only the, the magic number or elf version and its architecture. And once I get those information, I could have a, a, this kind of function where I took in path of that object file and I can read that file and then convert that in string and pass to the parse function, which is going to do a pattern match on those and take it out all those information. And I can look into all the structures and how all those information could be uh, take it out of, out of the binary blob of st strings of this particular executable. So it's very fairly decent, but we could have more information over here where I can have all those information which I shown in the previous slides, which read elf command, which is, uh, could do. So you can have something like that. But it's very basic version of that particular program in Elixir. So now we, this is the first part, like binary pattern matching. It's right there, intuitive. You describe you what you want to get. But you want to have a way to communicate with something over the wire. So you need some sort of an API or some sort of a linking so that you can talk. So there is like VSD socket APIs that comes in. We all learn about this in college. So using socket features, uh, which provided by our, most of the operating system, uh, whenever you want to communicate with one computer or another, these are the APIs which you use. For example, for socket, using socket, you create a socket, or which is in Linux is treated as a file. So you can read something to that socket or write something or write to the socket and it will be treated and you can have this uh, inter-process uh, inter communication between the uh, two different applications on two different computers. So using connect, you can connect or you can listen to some clients uh, and then you can accept those clients and you can send and receive. The, all these APIs are available in Linux uh, in C bindings for this thing, but you need in, in Erlang as well. So this is a very uh, overview of how it happens. They, you have a server and a client, and client want to establish some sort of a connection. So these are the flow of how things work. You create a socket, you bind that to a particular port or socket, you listen on that. Whenever someone try to connect, you accept that. And each one of the client and server has to create its own socket. So that each, so the server, and the, uh, when it sends information, can write that to that socket because it's treated as a file. And you can use basic primitives, which is provided by Linux, read and write functions to really send information back and forth. And you can later on close the connection. Similar ideas uh, is available in uh, the Erlang APIs as well. So using connect and accept and close these, all of the things you could achieve, same what you could do. And this is just a binding for those socket connections. So this is a very fairly simple example where you have your database for example, MySQL is running up on your local server and you want to connect to that server. So you could have something, uh, for example, the default port, uh, the port of the mm, MySQL database server is 3306, and you pass these options. And what these options describe, what most important is this active false. By default, if you don't pass this, what's happened is these, when you try to connect, the information the server sent is directly con converted into a some sort of a, uh, not some sort of, it's converted into a Erlang message. And you don't want to uh, overflow your bu buffer, uh, which each uh, Erlang pro processes has. So you want information when you need to have it. So you, you d make a blocking call, blocking call, call so that, hey, I need this much information. Can you send this back? And, sends information, and then using this socket, you can send and receive these using these APIs. So this. Yeah. 
here's more in Erlang. The same example, but uh, with a different view. You can have something this way, and you can send using this particular socket some data or close that connection. And similarly, so you can look up more information uh, on Gen TCP APIs on Erlang Docs. This will come handy later on in the talk, why behaviors, uh, you have to know uh, behaviors, because there is another one behavior, which is a custom behavior written by James Fish, which is important for having a long running uh, types of uh, processes, especially database type drivers to build. You need uh, a special kind of behavior, which is a DB connection behavior. So what's the behavior? So OTP design pattern has two main components, a generic, part, which is called server, or specific part where you describe what, what your specific things you want to have, so generic and specific. So why it's important? You can have a separation of concern. Be, uh, there are things which can be handled by the beam itself by providing these uh, features by, for example, gen server, gen statum to building state machine, or gen event to building event handlers, and so on. So you just have to plug in your component, that's it, and you're good to go. Uh, of course, easier to understand the code. If everyone st uh, start with the basic primitive and spawn and all, and have a read, eval uh, those uh, recursion loop where you have to read, it will be quite hard to understand. So having a design pattern is a good idea. So this is. This is one example from a Francesco book, uh, which is a process of a skeleton. Uh, you have to go through this loop. One thing you will figure it out that the server and the client part, which we have discussed, is intertwined. So all of these could be separated. But in here, in this example, so which is not the case. So you are doing your specific part as well as your generic part right into one big uh, process. So these are the differences of generic and specific. For example, you can spawning a server, a generic task, and but what should be the state of that server? It's something very specific to your use case. Storing what's the loop data would be, what the state it's going to uh, have. So that's a generic. The, the data itself, it is specific to your use case, and so on. And these are like the basic differences to understand. So gen stand Erlang and OTP provide various types of OTP behaviors, such as gen server, gen statum. Gen server is used for storing states. Uh, and gen statum for building state machines. So you can have a, you can easily build state machines. And gen event and supervisor. So the, the gen events and statums are like worker processes and supervisor is like a main role who's, who can, who let, uh, who, mm, just. So the supervisor will supervise. Like it's, it doesn't have to. Uh, it does not control uh, uh, other processes. Doesn't control supervisor. Supervisor control all other processes. Like, for example, gen server and all. So this is one example of a gen server. So this is the generic. Like starting a gen server with, uh, which is a very generic thing. Sending a message is a generic task. Uh, so call is a synchronous, while the cast is asynchronous. What does that mean? We'll just know. This is from Elixir Docs. So it, this is a gen server of a stack. So you want pushing something to the stack. So so a stack could have a, a initial something. You can have uh, whatever the stack. And for example, when you send a call, it's going to pattern match to this handle cast. 
handle cast. I think I haven't uh, looked the code samples. Uh, uh, something is wrong here. But in cases of uh, cast, it will be synchronous. So it won't be uh, no reply. It would be a reply because it's a blocking call. While in case of a a call, uh, it's a asynchronous. So it won't be a blocking. We come to this uh, a behavior uh, later on. So let's take look at a, uh, the clients over how the communications happen. So what's the structure of a basic? Uh, MySQL packet. So most cases, a, uh, a MySQL packet has like, you could have information, something like that. You can have a big uh, packet on first uh, three uh, sections. One could have like, total is four bytes. So like for the information itself. So four bytes plus packet body, and the first one can have the packet length, what is the size of the, this particular packet, and which, is to, which takes about three bytes to store that information. And then a sequence number, uh, you could have, so this is the first packet I'm sending, so sequence number zero. So something come back, the sequence number one. So just to have a order of events, so we have something called sequence, num uh, sequence in a, a common basic MySQL packet, and it will take one byte. And the packet body itself, which could be uh, n, whatever the n size would be, which, def which can be described from here, like what is the actual packet sizes. So you would see like it's a three bytes. So if you do calculations, which means only 16 megabytes of uh, packet could be sent only one at a time in cases of, uh, of a MySQL. So you have to send, if you have a large chunk, so you have to chunk it out in a 16 megabyte uh, component uh, size, and you have to send it again and again. So this is very basic uh, structure of a standard packet. So this is how you, uh, for example, that uh, arbitrarily packet, if you want to pattern match it, so you describe exactly like, for example, the MySQL server send information back in a big Indian format, which is just the order of the integers, but in little opposite. It's kind of confusing, but but you, because in on Linux and most of the 64-bit machines, Intel has it's a little. Uh, it's supposed the order of the uh, the integers are little, but the MySQL server send it as a big. So you have to convert that, and you describe the payload length. So 24, which means three bytes. You can calculate, so each eight, eight, three, 24. So size into unit, that's the point. So you can have uh, different types of data. You could have a protocol have, like you could have information in forms of integer or strings. And we then we look at comma, uh, the connections and the command phase. So this is a flow diagram uh, how everything happens. So when you create a socket connection with your MySQL, so you have a some sort of a, your database server, and you want to make a socket connection. Making a socket connection, you and you are the the driver itself. The driver is a uh, like a term for a, a client which is trying to communicate with this database server. So when you try to do it, so this uh, MySQL database server sends a, a packet which is called initial handshake, handshake packet. So we look at the, so how it, this, is, this is, this entire uh, is, a, is a packet which is sent by the, for the first time when you try to connect over the wire using this Gen TCP. So this is the packet is going to, you're going to receive. It's going to have information what the protocol version is. So most cases in major version of either MariaDB as well as MySQL, the version is 10. And for backward compatibility and all. But most probably you have a protocol version to be 10. You can have a connection ID 
which describes the, what the connection number and all, and other informations. So this is the complicated packet, and you have to parse it. So how do you parse this information? And this is described like protocol version is, and what the server version is. And this information is a human readable version, and the connection ID, and bunch of fillers, just uh, null bytes, zero bytes, and uh, such as what are the capabilities, flags, and all and status slide. So this is how you write a very simple parser, uh, it, which is going to parse that initial handshake packet. So to parse the version number, you describe, OK, this is a, an integer. It has a size of 8, and it's of a little Indian format. And the connection ID, you describe that, OK, this is also a little uh, uh, Indian is, and it's an integer, and the size is uh, 32. And you describe all of those components, uh, and you take that binary. You have received the packet you received from the MySQL database server, and you just pattern match. And each of those components, such as version number, server number, connection ID, what the plugin part one is, the fillers and character set is using, is a UTF-8 or some other win other CTEs and so on. What are the ca uh, status flag? What are the capabilities flags are and all? And you just pattern match because you describe exactly what the binary data is. And this way, you able to parse initial hands handshake packet. Once the you got the packet, you able to parse. You able to get the, all the information you need. Now you have to complete this connection phase, you need to send another packet, which is called a initial response packet. So we'll take a look at how this response packet is. So this is the response packet. So a cap capability flex for if you're using cli uh, client protocol version like 4.1, what it means that they in, in, if you don't use this, so if no longer data is going to send you a, a another packet, in cases of success, it's going to send you an OK packet. We will look at what a structure of an OK packet or end of the file packet. But because you want to don't want to use, you want to just use OK packet for all the communication, so you just pass this capability flags. And capability flags are nothing but a, b a bunch of numbers, and you take Uh, capability flags, like uh, you can think of, like in binary, in bitwise operators, you have a bunch of numbers, and you can take all of a bunch of numbers, and in single number, you can have a lot of information uh, stored. So, for example, let's say one is representing some. Uh, some capabilities MySQL uh, I want to have in my database to have uh, because my uh, client is supporting and two is another feature so I'll take an OR of those bitwise operation and the number comes in so database server for example MySQL server able to figure it out okay these are the features these uh, this particular server able to understand so I need to uh, when I'm sending back any data or something I need to so keep that thing in mind. The is updated or not updated version of client. So there are a bunch of types which are like string or uh, null strings and all. Let's look at, uh, uh, understand all those types informations and then we go on. For example, this is a fixed length integer. You could have some. A uh, component which has only fixed length of numbers, or you could have an integer where you describe exactly the length of that particular uh, object or uh, the packet in in that packet, the components, and you could have something null terminated, like having an end with zero zero to describe. Okay, this is this kind of packet, or you could have uh, strings 
which are you can describe like uh, this string is 34 character and so on, or end with a length string and so on. These are the protocol data types. And you can see, for example, in this case, these are all those. So for example, resolved is a 23 character you already know because you already encoded. This is always going to be 23. So when you're going to parse it, for example, let's look at the packet itself. So for example, string it, the auth plugin data part one. So because I know already, so I can have those information, right? Because it's, you don't going to figure it out. It's already always going to be eight bits. And for then the handshake response. So these are the, all the information and the fields like capability flags, which I already explained, like a bunch of numbers, you club them together, it gives you this information. The whatever the max packet size is, those, all those information is going to be in this handshake response packet, which the like client is going to encode into a binary and send it over the wire using the Gen TCP APIs. And for that, for example, this, the capability, for, suppose these are the capability flags, uh, I just don't remember what those things does, uh, but you can look into documentation and you know, like for example, this, uh, if you, or these all, capability flags and you can have these much. These are the features it's going to be by default enabled whenever you try to communicate with your database server. And then what kind of authentication plugin you are using, for example, in here is a SHA-2 or there are others, or for example, in cases here, what are the username? What will be the auth response? All those payload information, and you describe it and convert that into a, a payload, which is another, mm, where you describe the entire thing, and you convert it into a binary string, and you attach a sequence. So the first information comes from uh, the database to, uh, to the client, has a sequence ID is zero, so just to look at the order of the events which come first, and then the things which comes afterward has an order of one. So, and then, and you have this data and the sequence ID and club into a binary packet. And then you can send using gen tcp dot send and send it to, to the server and server able to decipher it, the underlying database able to figure it, okay, these are the information has been sent. And so all of these information is, can be done and you can literally read every piece of and understand what's going on because there is, isn't lots of engineering is happening. It's very simple binary pattern matching. So this one is an okay packet. So if the capability, there is a client protocol 41, so it's going to have corresponding hex number for this particular, this uh, client protocol 41. It have a hexadecimal, so if you don't order it out, so for ending of the file, it's going to send you end of the file packet. But if you enable this, it's always going to send you an OK packet. No matter if the uh, only OK packet will be further. If you have a database which is, doesn't have these uh, features enabled, so you don't have to worry about it because it just, uh, it won't, uh, uh, it won't able to like figure it out. It just move on and take advantage of other ones. And this is a description of an OK packet, which is going to have information. For example, it's going to have an of a header, which describe okay, it's zero zero for success, and all the affected rows. What are the last inserted IDs? And these are all the informations. So this is the structure of an an OK packet. Uh, similarly, with OK packet, we can have different types of packets. For example, if you want to send a, a command or something like select star or something uh, for that, you could use uh, different types of packets and you use same basic ideas which I have presented. Uh, these binary pattern matching and encoded that and you send it over the wire. And it will just uh, give you back and you parse it, information, and the, but this is all good uh, 
for a basic use case for understanding and playing with. But for production use, you want to have your, you don't want to use this kind. You want, in, in production cases, your driver, for example, you're trying to connect and your database was down. So you need to deal with source so that you can have, like, for example, a backup mechanism so that after two seconds, you're going to retry after three, oh, each time multiplied. So these are the mechanisms are provided by the So these are the inf uh, mechanisms and APIs are provided by this library DB connections written by James Fish. It provides features such as, it's just a behavior just like a gen server or gen statum and all, it has a generic and specific. Generics are all of the hard part, like pooling. You want to have a bunch of open connections and to a database, you don't want to open. If you want to, uh, for example, query a, to a database server, you don't want to each time open a new connection and send that request. It will be very uh, inefficient. Rather, what you're going to have is you have open a bunch of connections at a time. You have in a pool. You take out those connections, do your query, and put it back. These are all the basic abstraction is provided by this particular library. It's similar with, for example, it's provide all of these APIs. So, for example, you could have you want to start your uh, client. So, so starting the client, using DB connection, then you can have like supervision and all good stuff and easy compatibility ecto, which is a upper layer where much better abstraction because you don't want to uh, talk to directly to a, a database driver because it's a breakable further down the line, something changes. So. So these are the APIs you have to uh, implement, which is a specific to your database driver. For example, a Postgres for MongoDB or MySQL, these are the things you have to uh, uh, implement, and it's going to have a return in a certain format, or oh, okay, certain if something happens or error or something. So in, in a tuple format and then it can figure it out, you can execute, or you can have, for example, you want to have a prepared statements and all, all of these. So these are the DB connection libraries it allow you to do that thing. So, so I'm going to show um, the driver I have a prototype at that time. So using this basic ideas. a general uh, Elixir uh, program. So we have a higher level module which describe all of those, the, for example, the start link uh, function, which, for example, of a, if I want to start a, a, my driver as a process, which underlying, in, which underlying the DV connection uh, which is going to handle. So for that, you can have these uh, the external APIs through which you start a, a, a driver and all. So, for example, DV connection start, and you provide what are the protocols. And for protocol case, if you go and look, you, here you describe the connect. For example, I have just implemented the connect API, and you provide those inform, information, and you send information, for example, OK state, or if there is an error, an error. It's, it's not compliant with the API itself, but you get the gist. And similarly, for example, uh, check in and check out. So if you want to take uh, any database connections out of the pool, you using this API, you can check in those connections, and you, you're done with your work, and you send it back to the pool so that other processes should want to con uh, use that connection. And for example, similar with the case with uh, parsing the, the handshake packet and all, and sending in and receiving information, and all the of sending and receiving over the wire happens. It's going to uh, happening over here. So we directly, if you want, uh, when we are trying to connect, we're connecting and you're providing all the 
information and then we connecting and using these functions, which just a wrapper over the Gen TCP APIs, uh, connect and receive and all, and sending information and so on. So directly communicates to the, our database server. So this is a very basic uh, I ideas uh, how you could have a very simple database driver uh, really quickly and using very simple ideas and very quickly. If, uh, but f if you want to have something like my SQL kind of, which is much more detailed and much more uh, robust or and also very easy to understand as well. You can literally read the code and understand most part of it, which is one of the beauty of uh, binary pattern matching. Same, for example, uh, the, the production, the open source project has the same API. It's go, it is implementing the startling function. For, so you can have my SQL module dot startling and start the MySQL driver and for querying and all. So these all the high level APIs it's implementing. And so this was the uh, com ping, for example, you want to ping to your, using your client toward your database. Uh, so this is what's happening here. Uh, you're sending the com, and if you look the implementation, so you can read most of it uh, fairly easily because it's very easy to read, and binary pattern matching allow us to have this complicated piece of hardware. And this is not it's, it's less than 5,000 lines of code. But if you look at other implementations for different languages, it's like tens and thousands of lines. But I, even in that case, you cannot read it in directly. But here, you can understand fairly most part of it, what's going on, because the simplicity of the whole Elixir binary pattern matching and then API and ecosystem uh, the Elixir brings to the table. Uh, so to learn more, I have collected the most of the resources. So this is the book I have read in 2018. I like it's cover to cover. It's a really good book if you are into understanding deeper level how database servers actually works inside the, by the code. Like you can you cannot read the entire code. It's very complicated. But but yeah, this book is really good, and it has a chapter on client server and communication. And there is a three series article with uh, by Wostek the 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 author of the my SQL library, and he, he has described all those components which I have presented in my talk. And you can watch his the, the latest talk, and there is Andreas post on handling different types of TCP connections. So he also goes on to generic and specific how those connections could happen fairly easily, and you can look into the DB connection, the documentation itself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and And I want to thank you again, the Elixir uh, Ecosystem Foundation, uh, because without them, I wouldn't be here. So thank you very much.